Tuberculosis in children is a really important topic. I think I can ask any medical student, have you seen a child with TB in the wards? And everybody will say yes. This is a really old slide. It's about 15 years old. Um, so the map on the top left shows you tuberculosis around the world and you can see the darker pink it was the more tuberculosis. The maps on the right are from a site called worldmapper.org which shows the world not in terms of square kilometers or surface area but the top one shows it in terms of population number and you can see which areas of the world bulge in terms of many people. So Africa is not that huge but once you look at it uh, at the bottom map from the point of view of tuberculosis, Sub-Saharan Africa start, suddenly starts to get a bulge. The other areas that are bulging are India and Southeast Asia. So these are the areas of the world that still have a high TB incidence. So here are a whole lot of um, facts. I will not read all of them. Um, you will have time to go through them as you go through this PowerPoint. Um, but I do just want to highlight some of them. So there are six countries that make up most of the cases of the world, and South Africa is one of them. Of all the countries in the world, South Africa has the highest incidence, which means the number of people per population that are affected by tuberculosis. And this has been the case for the last few years. The global incidence has fallen and um, the WHO is working towards an end TB strategy. And there are certain milestones that need to be reached by 2020. South Africa indeed has reached um, those milestones, but we are still working towards 2030 and 2035. Annually, at the moment, about 10 million people fall ill with tuberculosis, and most of them are in the low- and middle-income countries. As the diagnosis of tuberculosis is not that straightforward, um, we think that about 60, in the 60s percent of people that have TB are actually diagnosed, and that many people who have TB are missed in making a diagnosis. Um, and the number of children that are affected by tuberculosis worldwide is about 11% um, of all the cases. And um, it's estimated that it's about 1 million children per annum that fall ill and of these 170,000 die. Um, so that's 17% uh, mortality, which is extremely high. Drug-resistant TB is quite high. Um, and it's about 5% uh, globally, but some countries in the world have much higher incidence of drug-resistant TB. It is responsible for about a quarter of deaths because of the extensive resistance to antimicrobacterial um, drugs. And TB is the most important killer of people who are HIV infected. TB is a social disease with medical consequences. TB has been around for three, four thousand years. If you recollect the lecture from third year, Egyptian mummies have been shown to have tuberculosis. And of course, um, one can prove that if one puts mummies into a scan and you can pick up the telltale picture of TB of the bones. So TB is much more common among less privileged people the infection rate is higher because the population density is higher. There are many more people per household. Nutrition might be poor, and that contributes to compromised immunity. Homelessness, alcoholism, all contribute to compromised immunity. And because people live closer together, your risk of being infected is higher, and the risk of then developing TB disease is much higher. So historically, there has been a lot of tuberculosis in Europe in the 17 and 1800s. And as uh, housing and nutrition improved in those areas and attention was given to um, people's 
um, livelihoods during the Industrial Revolution, in fact, the incidence of tuberculosis decreased before medication was available. So just to give you a little bit more detail about the epidemiology of tuberculosis, worldwide there are probably 53 million people with latent tuberculosis. Um, probably about a third of the global population is infected with tuberculosis. And of these, 5 to 15 percent in their lifetime will then develop TB disease. So per annum, there's about 10 million new cases, as I said, of which 7 million are treated because some of the others are not diagnosed. So these are rough estimates. And there is an estimate of 3 million deaths per annum, which, equiva uh, which is equivalent to one jumbo jet falling down every single day per year. 85% of cases occur in the top 20 countries, of which South Africa is one. As I mentioned earlier, we are working towards an NTB strategy. South Africa is on track, but we still have a lot of work to do. The global incidence of TB is 130 per 100,000, so that's taking all the countries in the world together. Um, eight countries have an incidence of about 400, and you can see South Africa is one of them, and has the highest incidence per population, which is 520 per 100,000. If you make it 500 per 100,000 and take away the zeros, um, you will see that it's um, 5 per 1,000 people, which means 1 in 200 people in South Africa is uh, affected by tuberculosis per year. So we have between probably 250 and 400,000 new cases per year in South Africa with a mortality um, of between 37 and 73 per 100,000. And more than half of these cases are linked to HIV infection. In, uh, in South Africa, the incidence among children is anywhere between 5 and 40 percent. Um, globally, it's about 11 percent. So it depends in which area um, you assess how many children are affected by TB. In the Western Cape, of all the TB cases, 40% occur among children. In the Free State, it's probably around about 15%. And in some areas, it's probably much less. Globally, this is what the population pyramid looks like of the people that are affected by tuberculosis. Um, so you see that children are not those that are most affected. In fact, it's the age group that is the working age group, the parents that are most affected. Children make up a small amount. They do not contribute to the epidemic. However, if they are affected by TB, they often have worse TB and it's not easy to diagnose and it may have lifelong consequences. So just to give you some more pictures of the epidemiology of tuberculosis. So if you remember the first slide that showed you the incidence of TB about 15 years ago, um, you see there are some changes um, compared to 2018. So there is certainly an improvement. But the high incidence countries are Sub-Saharan Africa and um, Southeast Asia and then some areas in South America. And this slide shows you how many of the patients that are affected by tuberculosis are children. And again, you can see which areas have children as an important part of percentage of the group of people that are new cases with TB per annum. So this comes from the WHO Global TB Report, which comes out um, at the end of every year. So the latest one is the one from 2019 in um, November last year, and it reflects the previous year. And here you can clearly see that the incidence is 520 per 100,000. Um, and you can see that the mortality is between 37 and 73 per 100,000 population population. 
and of the new cases that are affected by drug resistant TB is about 3.4 percent. But the good news that you can see is looking at the graph on the top right, you can see the um, incidence per 100,000 population from the year 2000 to 2018. And if you just look at the um, black line, which represents the notified cases. So the cases that were notified by healthcare workers to the Department of Health. Um, and you can see that there was a bend in the curve around about 2009. And this was when um, ARTs were made available to everybody when testing for HIV has become the norm. And you can see that that has made a big difference to, to, to the tuberculosis incidence. So the total incidence is that green line and then the gray shaded area about that is the area that we're not quite sure. So the black line is what we know, but we probably have much more cases than what we know. The um, population pyramid below that shows again that the bulk of or the group in South Africa that is mostly affected by TB is from uh, 14 years and above. And you can see it's the working group, it's the parents. So that's very important to consider when we do see young children with tuberculosis in terms of thinking where did they get it. Um, the bottom left um, graph shows the estimated TB mortality rates in South Africa. And you can see a similar trend to the graph on the top right with a decrease in mortality over the years. And that is closely linked to HIV. And just to show you a cartoon of the countries in the world that are high burden countries and um, the problem of being high burden is TB and the load of drug resistant TB and then the load of TB combined with HIV and the countries that have all three problems simultaneously as a big problem, you can see South Africa is one of them. So we need to tackle both of these at the same time to get on top of tuberculosis. So how does infection occur? TB is spread by persons with open pulmonary TB. These organisms are carried in droplets in aerosol and they need to be inhaled and the risk of inhaling aerosol droplets with tuberculosis depends on the size of the room that you're in, the ventilation that, how ventilated the room is, how many people are in the room, and the duration of contact, and the amount of organisms in the aerosol droplets. So the bacillary load of the person who is um, exhaling the organisms. After inhalations, a few organisms reach the terminal airways and then these spread to the alveoli. This person is now infected, is not yet diseased. Remember this as we go down the other slides. So usually the cellular mediated immunity stops the process of uh, infection at this stage. Um, it takes time to work, um, but the T cells are the main factors in breaking this in, uh, infection. And if this is not managed well, the organisms can continue to multiply and then they can form nodular granulomas, form tubercles and spread throughout the tissue. The disease associated with a TB infection is caused both by the organisms and by the immunological reaction associated with the disease. Tuberculosis uh, bacilli are acid-fast bacilli. They replicate very slowly, they are difficult to culture, and they are difficult to treat. They survive in macrophages and they can survive probably a few years. Um, and then it's just important to remember that the cellular immune response is reduced in young children, in malnourished people, in HIV-infected people, and therefore they cannot break the process of infection to disease that well. Most children that become ill 
from tuberculosis become ill within the first year after they were infected. So after inhalation, you can either have immediate destruction of the organisms, or these organisms can survive in macrophages and eventually then be destroyed, or they survive in macrophages and uh, the disease process goes on to pulmonary disease. The organisms can then multiply in the lymph nodes. They can spread to blood vessels um, through um, breaking of lymph nodes into small blood vessels. You can get hematogenous spread of organisms to anywhere in the body. This usually occurs within the first year after infection. What may also occur is that you can get a latent infection, um, as noted in point two, and um, that can stay and one can have reactivation of disease many years after the original infection. I would like you to have a good look at this um, diagram. What it shows is it clearly shows the difference between infection and disease. And that is a continuum. So if one starts on the left, this is the person who's become infected. And at this stage, you can eliminate the infection. If the infection is not eliminated by the person, it develops into a latent TB infection. And this can then be reactivated in time. Um, it's estimated that of the people that develop latent TB infection, about 15% reactivate sometime in their lifetime. This can then slowly progress to a subclinical disease and then to active TB disease, which is the patient that we often see in our healthcare setting. So if you look at the different um, investigations that one can do and how can one diagnose these different stages. Let's start with the sputum smear in the middle. And you can see that the sputum smear will be negative until you have very advanced disease. And even then, it may be positive or negative, depending on the bacillary load of that cough, of that sputum specimen that was submitted to the laboratory. So it may be negative today and positive tomorrow. So having a negative sputum smear is not a sign that you do not have tuberculosis. That's the one lesson. And the second one is if you send in a sputum smear, you have to send in at least two. And the third lesson is that if you have a sputum smear that is positive, that patient has a very high bacillary load, meaning coughs out a lot of organisms and is very infectious. Let's look at the line above that, which is the culture. And you can see that that will be negative in uh, latent TB and maybe intermittently positive in subclinical disease. So again, you have to send in more than one specimen and is usually positive in active TB disease. So why is the culture positive and the sputum smear positive or negative? Again, that depends on the bacillary load. So you need a much lower bacillary load for a culture to be positive. And that's why it is really important to always send a sputum for smear and definitely always for a culture. And preferably send two specimens for a culture. I will talk about the gene expert later. The top two lines are the tuberculin skin test and the IGRA test, which is a blood test. Both of these reflect the immune response to tuberculosis, and you see that they are positive at the same time. So we do not do IGRA tests routinely because they are very expensive, and the meaning is much the same as the skin test. If you see when it becomes positive, it becomes positive if a person is infected with tuberculosis. It does not differentiate between TB infection and TB disease. And I'll talk about the TB skin test later as well. And let's go to the last, second, uh, third, last lines. So who is infectious? 
And as I said with the sputum smear, if your smear is positive, you are definitely infectious. And if you have subclinical disease, you may have organisms or may not, and therefore you will be sporadically infectious. And symptoms start occurring once you have active TB disease and are infectious. So you could have very mild symptoms and be sporadically infectious and not really seek medical treatment yet but already contribute to the epidemic in your community. And the preferred treatment, once a person has disease, is multidrug treatment. And uh, what, if it's still latent, we use preventive therapy. It is now also called treatment of latent TB infection. This is a very important slide uh, showing important concepts, and I wish that you... Um, Please try and understand this. This is, uh, shows the risk of going from latent TB to TB disease. And um, this table is also in the Kuvadia textbook. So what this shows is that young children have a very high risk to progress to disease. So a child under one year of age has a 50% risk of progressing to disease. And the risk of going on, of the, those 50% that go on to disease, um, just under half of them have a risk of developing TB meningitis or disseminated extensive TB disease, which is a very high risk. And you can see that basically the under five-year-olds have a higher risk of going to disease than older children. And therefore, these children we do treat the latent TB infection to prevent them going on to more extensive disease. Reactivation of latent TB can occur some years after the primary infection. And um, I've listed the conditions that are associated with reactivation. And um, you can see then those that we need to be aware of are um, children with diabetes and HIV infection that may reactivate TB disease, um, the very young, and then pregnant women. And that is important in pediatrics because pregnant women may reactivate TB disease and it may be a problem in their newborn. Any child with a malignancy, we always have to be aware that they may reactivate the previous TB infection. This is called Walgren's Curve. It is also in your textbook. And what it shows is if point zero is the point of infection, when does TB disease show? So the blue line shows the time of hypersensitivity. I will show you later in the lecture what are manifestations of hypersensitivity. But the most important one that we make use of is reaction to the t injected tuberculin. So if a child was infected at point zero, it takes about one to two months for them, for the Mantu test to become positive. So it does not help to do a Mantu test if the presumed infection was quite recent. So it does take time. Um, then the manifestations of disease are a bit later. So after point zero of infection, Miliary TB and TB meningitis, which is hematogenous, is spread, is the most um, early manifestation. Um, if the child does not develop that um, and manage to contain um, TB, lymph node disease develops a bit later and then pulmonary disease later. So where this is helpful is if you have a child with TB meningitis and you can look retrospectively, you may be able to ask um, the family and they may be able to be to recollect that there was someone in the household who had TB just about three months ago. Once it's six months or eight months, people um, may forget who could have been the source case for the TB. The other important thing from this graph is that most children that develop TB disease after infection develop it within 12 months of the original infection if they are not immune compromised. However, if they are immune compromised, um, TB disease can develop ongoingly until 
that immune compromise is resolved or they are at risk of developing TB disease all the time. So this is an outline of the next few bits of the lecture. So I will now show you how to make a diagnosis, how um, children present with TB. I will say something about the management, which is not only the drug treatment. I'll say something about TB and HIV co-infection, drug-resistant TB, preventing TB, and staying up to date. Because what I teach you today might have changed in the next two to three or four years. You must please remember this. You cannot make a diagnosis by just looking at an x-ray and saying this is TB. The diagnosis of tuberculosis needs to be made with consideration. You need to consider these six aspects. And if they have not gone through your brain, you have not diligently yet thought of the diagnosis of TB. So you have to consider what in the history helps me in making a diagnosis of TB. What clinical findings might substantiate my diagnosis? Can the TB skin test help me? What do the radiological investigations show? Have I tried to actually prove the diagnosis by sending in sufficient and adequate specimens to the laboratory? And which other aspects are important in putting together this diagnosis of tuberculosis? So we'll go through these aspects. The history of the child. Just remember who is giving the history. Does this person know the child well or not? That is important. Most of the symptoms that children have who have TB disease are very nonspecific. And there are many causes of these symptoms. However, beware a child who loses weight and beware a child who's coughing for longer than three weeks. You have to think of tuberculosis. But any of the other ones may be important. And remember that you also have to get a history of a possible source case. So please do not just write in your notes TB Contact Plus because that is really very inadequate uh, information. You need to know who is the source case and preferably give them a name. That is, is this source case coughing? Did the source case die? Do they know why the child died, why the person died? And then it's also important to find out possibly what are the laboratory results of the source case. If this person had a smear positive sputum result, he was highly infectious. And in st research studies that were published several years ago, it's found that if someone is smear positive, 60 to 80 percent of those children in the household are actually infected. If they are smear negative, meaning that they have a much lower bacillary load, a much smaller percentage of children are infected. Also remember that if a child is under three years old and he is diagnosed with TB, about 80% um, of these children are infected by someone in the same house. And that is just easy to understand because three-year-olds do not wander off on their own and if they are infected by tuberculosis, it is by someone in the same house. Just get an idea of who this possible source case is. Is it the grandmother that shares the bed with the child? Is it the uh, daycare minder? Is it the teacher in the creche who is in a small room with the child the whole day? Find out whether this person is actually on treatment and whether they're responding to treatment. And if one doesn't find anybody, it is still your duty if you diagnose a child with TB to do some reverse uh, contact tracing and try and find the possible source case. If you examine a child who's got tuberculosis, you might not find very much. So you might just find a low weight um, a child who's listless, who doesn't eat well. Um, and then most of the children do have intrathoracic TB, so most of the signs may be um, pulmonary, but as children mostly have lymph node disease, if you examine them, you will actually not find very much. If children have extra pulmonary disease, they may have more 
signs that you can pick up. But there are very few specific clinical findings where you can say this is tuberculosis. But a few of them are the following that I've listed. Matted cervical nodes, especially if they break down and you get sinus formation with the skin, that is fairly um, indicative of tuberculosis. A child with a gibbous, which is a kyphosis of the spine, a child with a gibbous has TB unless, until proven otherwise. So if you see a child with a gibbous, it is your duty to refer this child so that this child is investigated appropriately, which would be a CT scan and plus or minus a biopsy to confirm the diagnosis. A child with scrofuloderma, I will show a picture later. Um, if you have seen it a few times, it is a fairly typical presentation of tuberculosis. A child with a distended abdomen with ascites in South Africa, you have to think of tuberculosis. There are other causes, but that has to go through your mind. And a child with a non-tender enlarged joint, think of tuberculosis. And then look at the child's nutritional status, uh, do an HIV test, and look at other associated diseases that the child might have. It may be important in planning the management of the child and fig figuring out um, possible drug interactions. What is the use of immune-based testing in your workup of a child who might have tuberculosis? So the TB skin test will only tell you that the child is infected by tuberculosis. But it may just be a clue and help you to make a decision. Remember that you can have a false negative uh, TB skin test, and that may be in children who are malnourished, who are immune compromised, or have overwhelming TB disease. And measles also used to contribute to false negative TB skin tests. The TB skin test may be positive, and there are a few children that may be infected by non-tuberculous mycobacteria. So it is useful, but it is not an absolute test. The interferon gamma assay um, is available in private. It is useful, it is quite expensive, and it does not give you much more information than the TB skin test. Radiological investigations are really useful and very helpful. As pulmonary TB is the most common manifestation of TB disease in children, a chest X-ray is really useful. And this is the one time when you would request a lateral chest X-ray because it does show enlarged hyaluronic nodes. I will show you chest X-ray pictures later to demonstrate that. Um, Make a habit of looking at the chest X-ray and describing what you see and not only saying the chest X-ray looks like TB. Um, it is good discipline to describe what you see because it forces you to really think, is this possibly tuberculosis or not? Sonos may help you um, and CT scans may are very important if you have... Uh, nervous system tuberculosis, abdominal sonars are useful, x-rays of joints and bones if you are considering TB of the knee for instance, and an MRI of anywhere where you think there may be TB is really useful and can show the necessary details. Please always try to prove the diagnosis of tuberculosis. Um, Firstly, there are several diseases that may mimic TB, and it's useful to know, is this possibly TB? And secondly, it is very useful to know, is this drug-sensitive TB or not? So consider what you can send to the laboratory. So sputum is the standard that is sent to the laboratory. In children under the age of four who swallow their sputum, you can send swallowed sputum called a gastric aspirate to the laboratory, or you can induce them to produce sputum by giving them a hypertonic saline nebulization, irritates the airways, they cough up and you get sputum. 
you can send a fine needle aspiration of a node, you can send joint fluid, an ascites aspiration, pleural fluid aspiration to the laboratory for microscopy and culture. You can also take a biopsy. And please remember, if you take a biopsy, take two pieces. One piece in formalin that goes for histology and another piece in normal saline that gets sent for culture. It is really important to try and get cultures so that drug sensitivity tests can be done. In South Africa, all specimens sent to the laboratory for TB investigation have basic drug sensitivity tests done on them. However, remember that if you send a specimen only for microscopy, it is nearly impossible to do a drug sensitivity test. Remember also that I said that the TB organisms grow very slowly and therefore the laboratory waits for up to 42 days to check whether there was any growth. And this may mean that it may take time for you to get your results. However, if the patient has many organisms and the culture test became positive within a week or two weeks, the laboratory will certainly have the results available to you within that time. So apart from doing smears and cultures, um, PCR-based testing is now becoming really important in tuberculosis. And the current uh, main test that is used is the Gene Expert Ultra. And the NHLS at the moment routinely will test any sputum specimen, gastric aspirate, and CSF specimen with a Gene Expert Ultra. So what the Gene Expert does as it is a PCR-based test, it looks for the genetic material that tells you this is M. tuberculosis. It identifies mutations that convey drug resistance. And the current one that is looked for is the rifampicin mutation. So if you get a result back that says gene expert positive RIF resistance, you at least know that this um, patient has a drug-resistant organism. You can start on treatment and then you still have to wait for the rest of the results from the culture to get the rest of the drug resistance profile. Because if it's rifampicin resistance, you only know about rifampicin and not about res resistance to other antimicrobacterial drugs. So the last part of your workup for tuberculosis is to always do an HIV test to consider is a biopsy important. Um, ADA may be useful on pleural pericardial and ascites fluid. Adenosine deaminase is an enzyme produced by the monocytes which are active in the immune reaction to tuberculosis. And then just consider comorbidities. When you make the diagnosis of tuberculosis, it is important therefore to say which organ is affected. Is it confirmed TB or probable TB? What is the severity of the TB and associated complications? For instance, a child may have TB spine with associated paraplegia. Is this a first time or previously treated TB? Is it drug sensitive or drug resistant? And what are the other associated diseases that may also need attention? So I've given an example of what a comprehensive diagnosis of tuberculosis should look like. TB presentation will vary with age. So young children often have miliary TB. Um, the young are those that bear the brunt of having CNS disease. Mo many children have lymph node disease, which can manifest as lymph nodes in the neck or lymph nodes in the mediastinum, and that will show on chest X-ray. So the reason for children having lymph nodes in the neck is that the neck lymph nodes are contiguous with those in the chest area and children have lymph node disease and adults don't. Um, so that's a big difference between children and adults. Many more children have extra pulmonary disease. Um, children have skeletal TB and that is mainly of the weight bearing joints, but any joint can be affected. The children between the age of 5 and 10 years have very low risk of disease progression.
and you can check the slide a few slides back showing the risk of going from infection to disease. And adults have cavitary lung disease. Children sometimes have cavitary lung disease, but much less common than among adults. Once the organisms are inhaled and they settle in the lung, one can get an area of the lung with some consolidation, and that is called a gone focus. The organisms then are drained to the regional lymph nodes, and they enlarge, and together with the primary lung lesion and the enlarged hyaline nodes, one gets a gone complex. Then the bacilli may multiply, and they can spread via the lymphatic ducts, or they may erode into small blood vessels, and they can then be distributed to many other areas of the body. Some children do develop extensive adult-type lung disease, but not as common as among adults, and many children develop extra pulmonary TB disease. So here are a few pictures um, demonstrating what I've been talking about. So for about 100 years, we've now had x-rays that assist us in the diagnosis of tuberculosis. In the picture on the left, you can see a large gone focus. Um, this is not a lymph node, this is separate from the hyla area, and it's in the left lower lobe in the mid zone. On the right, you can see a gone focus that has cavitated. Here you can see a calcified gone focus on the right mid zone. Um, the lymph organisms have then been drained to the regional lymph, lymph nodes, and you can see an enlarged. Um, mediastinal lymph node on the left. Here you can see enlarged lymph nodes um, left and right on both um, x-rays and on the x-ray on your right you can also see that there are some calcifications in the lymph node which is one of the reactions that TB evokes in the lymph nodes. So here you can see why it is really important to take a lateral x-ray. So if you look at the AP x-ray, you may possibly say that there are enlarged lymph nodes. But if you look on the lateral x-ray, you can clearly see the central density. You can see the trachea, and you can see where the trachea ends is the carina, and then around this area is a dense mass. Some people call this the hamburger sign. Um, and this is quite typical of primary pulmonary TB in children caused by enlarged mediastinal lymph nodes. Here's another picture again showing much the same. But if you look carefully on the AP x-ray, you can see that the left lung is blacker than the right lung. Would you like to think why this could be? So on the following x-rays, I will show you that sometimes these enlarged lymph nodes can compress the big airways. And if you look carefully on the AP x-ray on your left, you can see the right main bronchus, but you cannot see the left main bronchus. So the left main bronchus is compressed, and therefore uh, the child can inhale but cannot exhale the air. And then you get hyperinflation, which is the very black lung on the left. And this Hyperinflated black lung compresses the right lung, which also cannot inflate very well because it is compressed. The whole mediastinum has shifted across slightly to the right. And in fact, this child is rather in trouble, is hypoxic, because neither lungs can ventilate very really well. If you look on the lateral, you see that enlarged lymph node mass, and you can see the small calcifications. These x-rays show you compressed airways, so it's really important to always look at the big airways as well. This x-ray shows a pleural effusion on the left x-ray, and on the right you can also see an effusion. And you're not quite sure what you can see um, in the upper area, upper zone of the left lung, um, and there may be breakdown as well. So these are the features that you may see on x-rays of children with pulmonary disease. Um, the enlarged mediastinal lymph nodes with tuberculosis may erode into 
the carina or may erode into one of the bronchi and then this cages material can spread throughout both lungs and then we get bronchogenic spread of um, TB in the, into both lungs. If you look carefully, you can see that there's some compression of both bronchi, but the left one shows quite nicely. The x-ray on the left shows cavity formation, which is unusual in children. The x-ray on the right shows cavity formation in the left upper zone, and you can see a cross-section of a CT scan with destruction of the left lung and the big cavity. This is a typical feature of Miller-Reed tuberculosis. Um, you can see the small millets, which is a word for small seeds, absolutely everywhere in the lung, both sides. And this is hematogenous spread of tuberculosis. And if the lung looks like this, the rest of the body also looks like this. These children are quite sick. And if you don't treat Miller-Reed TB soon and diligently, every child with Miller-Reed TB will have TB meningitis as well. This x-ray also shows the result of a compression of the right bronchus from enlarged lymph nodes with resultant collapse of the right upper lobe. The line that you see going upwards is actually the horizontal fissure, which should be horizontal. This is a picture of a very ordinary right upper lobe pneumonia, probably caused by pneumococcal meningitis but this child also had underlying tuberculosis. So be very careful to say that the x-ray is typical of tuberculosis. Never make a diagnosis only on an x-ray, but get as much other collaborating information as possible. Go through step one to, through to step six. So lung disease in children can then um, because many young children have enlarged lymph nodes, these lymph nodes can then compress the airways. They can result in hyperinflation and or collapse. Furthermore, lung disease in children can present as pleural effusions, cavity formation, and some unfortunate children then will go on to have destructive lung disease with bronchiectasis and lifelong chronic lung disease. The main manifestation of extra pulmonary TB disease is lymphadenopathy, and mostly it's in the neck area um, if it's not in the chest. The diagnosis can be confirmed by doing a fine needle aspiration and then sending the aspirate for microscopy and culture um, to both histology and to the TB lab. And um, just one needs to collect an adequate specimen and um, get those results. If it is not possible, remember this is one of the forms of TB that on clinical grounds, you can be pretty sure that your diagnosis is correct. But remember, always try and prove your diagnosis microbiologically. Here's a picture showing uh, enlarged neck nodes, and you can also see that you get sinus formation, it was healed, uh, it healed and then sinus formation again, and these scars then remain to show the tale of previous TB adenitis. The next most common form of extra pulmonary TB, and importantly, is miliary TB and TB meningitis or intracranial tuberculomas. The diagnosis of miliary TB is not that easy. However, the chest x-ray may help you, um, showing the miliary spread of um, the organisms. These children are often really ill. They have hepatosplenomegaly, generalized lymphadenopathy, and um, many of those have the early signs of TB meningitis already. So sputum MCNS is not often um, very useful because um, the sputum doesn't often show the mycobacteria. And probably the most useful um, investigation to prove the diagnosis is a bone marrow aspirate or a blood culture using the TB culture bottles. These are some more pictures of Miller TB. 
and you can see the small milia absolutely everywhere. Um, if you remember the slide showing Volgren's curve, you will remember that TB meningitis presents quite soon after the original primary infection. The pathology is an inflammation of the meninges and an associated inflammatory exudate, which often develops around the base of the brain, and this envelops the cranial nerves and some of the blood vessels and can present with cranial nerve deficits. This inflammatory exudate will also block reabsorption of CSF through the arachnoid villi, and this may then result in a communicating hydrocephalus. The associated vasculitis may present as strokes and infarction because of thromboses that occur in the blood vessels. So the sooner you diagnose TB meningitis, the better, and there are several stages, and the more progressed TB meningitis is, the less the child's chance of actually recovering fully. So the history might fit that the child was listless, not feeling well, um, or presenting with a headache, and it can be for a few days already. So if you think that a child has meningitis, you should do a lumbar puncture, but just remember that if there are any localizing signs, it's your obligation to first do a scan before you do an LP. The findings on the CSF for TB meningitis are typically very raised protein, low glucose, and a lymphocyte predominant cell count. Remember to always send CSF for a PCR, uh, for a gene expert test. And if you do have enough CSF, request a TB culture as well. Doing ADA levels is not really very useful to assist with a diagnosis, um, as the other tests should already help you. And every child that you think has men TB meningitis should have a CT scan. And the reason for that is that it may confirm your diagnosis by showing the characteristic basal enhancement. It can also show you how severe the disease is and what the possible long-term disabilities will be by showing infarctions. And it will show a communicating hydrocephalus if it is present. And if that is present, you need to adjust your treatment accordingly and add furosemide and um, acetazolamide. And possibly um, c consider um, other treatment as well. So some children with TB meningitis may have an abnormal chest X-ray, but may not. They may have a MEN2 that may help you in your diagnosis, or may not. So um, you can see on the CT image on your left, the basal enhancement that shows with TB meningitis. On the CT on the right, you can see a large tuberculoma on um, the right-hand side and associated surrounding infarction. Mm -hmm. And you can also see that the ventricles are distended. The anterior horns of the ventricles should not be blunted like this, but should be sharp. And that already is an indicator that the ventricles are distended and there is the start of a communicating hydrocephalus. Again, some um, pictures showing you tuberculoma in the brain on the left and on the right you can see a, a scan of a child who had TB meningitis. He has recovered partially, but he has permanent um, infarcted areas on his left cerebral hemisphere and he will have permanent neurological disability. Here you can see a list of other forms of tuberculosis, and I have seen TB of nearly every organ of the body over many years. Osteoarticular TB is quite common in children. TB spine is a devastating disease because it permanently causes back problems. So you can see this child shows a thoracic kyphosis, which is quite marked um, as a result of vertebral collapse. If this is very severe, you can get compression on the spinal cord with associated neurological deficits.
And we have seen some children that then also present with a cold abscess around that area. So on this scan, you can clearly see collapse of the vertebra and destruction. And on the cross-sectional scan, you can see these uh, lytic lesions in the vertebral body. And anterior to the vertebral body, you can see a TB abscess. Uh, here you can see the child with these enlarged uh, phalanges, and um, this was GB dactylitis. And on the X-ray of the hips, you can see the child with the destruction of the femur head and the acetabulum. And this child will eventually need a hip replacement. Abdominal TB is seen quite frequently in the wards. These children are ill. They show severe weight loss. They may present with ascites. They may present with an abdominal mass, which may either be a mass of nodes or a mass of intestines or an appendix mass. Um, they may have diarrhea and less commonly protein losing enteropathy, which is very difficult to treat. And the diagnosis may be confirmed with an um, MRI and sonar and one can also then do biopsies and send that for cultures to confirm the diagnosis. So um, on the scan on your left, you can see these hyperdense lesions in the liver. Um, and on the right, you can see that this child was given contrast. So there's contrast in the intestines. And you can see the intestines only fill the rim of the abdomen. There are no intestines in the center where they should be, and the reason is that you can see those enlarged lymph nodes are swimming in the abdomen and pushing the intestine to the periphery. Um, the, as I said, on the chest x-rays, you sometimes get calcifications, and they may be visible on an abdominal x-ray, um, but it's not a routine, um, useful investigation to do. So a sonar of the abdomen may then show lymphadenopathy, ascites, thickened omentum, and abscesses in the liver or the spleen. This is a picture of scrofuloderma. This child had enlarged neck nodes that eroded into the surrounding skin. This is a rash called papillonecrotic tuberculi. Not very common, but fairly pathognomonic of tuberculosis. You get these very small papules on the extensive surface of the arm, especially the upper arm and on the helix of the ear. Here's another child with small papules and also these papules on the helix of the ear. And you can see this child also has an enlarged axillary lymph node. And um, this child was also HIV infected. Congenital TB is not very common. Um, it's important to consider if a mother was diagnosed with tuberculosis during pregnancy and was um, only started on treatment late. Once the baby is born, it's important to decide whether the baby has tuberculosis. And remember, if a baby was infected in utero, the baby will be infected via the umbilical cord and will then present with enlarged abdominal lymph nodes. So one would do an abdominal sonar to check for that. Um, the other way the baby might present is with miliary tuberculosis, and in that case, a chest X-ray and an abdominal sonar will assist with making the diagnosis. If the child has um, no disease, then a six-month course of INH is indicated so that this child will not develop TB disease if the baby was infected. It's important then to remember not to give the BCG as INH kills Mbovis, which is a live vaccine, uh, is part of the live vaccine of BCG, and give the BCG once the six month of INH has been completed. Um, remember when we looked at Volgan's curve, I said that delayed hypersensitivity takes about one to two months to develop. That was the light blue line. So what are the manifestations of delayed hypersensitivity? And the first is then the TB skin test. The second is there may be a low-grade fever. 
Thirdly, there is erythema nodosum. I'll show you pictures and tenular conjunctivitis. This is not TB disease. It's a manifestation of the hypersensitivity reaction. So just to recap how to do a tuberculin skin test, 0,1 mole of tuberculin solution is injected intradermally and the induration, meaning the swelling, is measured within 48 to 72 hours and you use a tape measure or a ruler to measure that. You should mark the edge of the induration by using a pen. You do not measure the redness but the swelling. And if you uh, draw a line with a pen, you can feel where the induration starts and you measure then the diameter of the induration. So the way to give the tuberculin is to give it in line with the um, radius and ulna and to give it in the upper two-thirds of the forearm and then to read it transversely 48 to 72 hours. Remember that if it is positive, it does not mean disease. It cannot differentiate infection from disease. Remember that you may have false negative reactions as well. And quite rarely, there may be false positive. If things don't make sense, ask an expert. This is a photo of a child with erythema nodosum. The bottom picture comes from a textbook, and the top was one of my patients. You can see that you cannot actually see the rash very really well. You feel it. It's very bumpy. It's in the subcutaneous tissue, and it's quite painful and tender. This is a flictin on the limbus of the cornea, and uh, it's not TB of the eye. It's a hypersensitivity reaction. May I remind you again, please always try to prove the diagnosis by bacteriological confirmation and by histology if indicated. So the bacteriological confirmation can be microscopy, which will only be useful if there are many organisms, by molecular testing, which is largely PCR-based, and by cultures. Histology will give you certain features of the um, TB um, disease, but it cannot differentiate drug-sensitive from drug-resistant TB, and it also cannot differentiate mycobacterium tuberculosis from other mycobacteria. Most of these items I've already um, mentioned, so just go through them. It is useful if you can send gastric aspirate in a container with sodium bicarbonate just to neutralize some of the gastric aspirate. It does increase the yield of uh, positive cultures. Unfortunately, it's not yet done routinely, um, but we may get a protocol where we know exactly how much soda big it's useful to add. But it would not be wrong to add about half a milliliter of 4% soda big, um, but then it needs to be done consistently. So very important, mark your specimens properly, give the correct information to the laboratory, because the laboratory staff can really assist you with proper results. So correct history and clinical findings, request the correct test, and always, always request the culture. These are pictures of organisms under the microscope. Just to remind you that, in fact, in children, this is often not seen, and therefore it is really important to send specimens for TB culture. This is just to show you the different um, tests that can be done now and how many new tests have been available um, to laboratories in the last 10 years. Um, the expert, you can see, was introduced in 2010. We now have the second generation expert, which has been around for about the last four years. And then there are um, other tests that are trying to make our life easier to diagnose tuberculosis. And you do not need to know all of these, but just be aware that uh, molecular-based testing is becoming much more important and useful in assisting us in making tiniest and early diagnoses.
So the current test that is used is the Gene Expert Ultra, and you can send sputum, gastric aspirin, CSF to the laboratory routinely. Stool specimens in children have been used to diagnose um, tuberculosis because stool contains swallowed sputum. Um, the laboratory may um, do a, a, take a special request if you need to send tissue or stool or any other specimen, but that would have to be arranged with a medical scientist in the laboratory. The usefulness is that at least you can do a initial drug sensitivity testing using the PCR um, and the current um, Gene Expert Ultra only looks for RIF resistance. However, if there are many organisms on the first specimen, the laboratory can do a PCR which includes INH mutations as well. So just to again uh, emphasize, it's really important to try and get bacteriological confirmation of um, tuberculosis cases. So you can see in the world, um, we are not yet sending enough specimens for bacteriological confirmation in South Africa. Um, please contribute to that so that we can confirm as many cases as possible. So if we don't have microbiological confirmation, how do we make a diagnosis? So remember the six steps again. If our clinical suspicion is high, um, we can use a skin test. If it is negative, we have no case. We don't really have an x-ray that is abnormal. We can follow up and we can repeat the x-ray. We can see how the child is. Remember, if there's no obvious sign of disease, TB is not a very fast disease. So we have time on our hands and we can use time as a diagnostic tool. If the skin test is positive, we do know the child is infected. And if they're enlarged hyaluronic nodes and we don't have microbiological confirmation, we should treat and then call it a case of possible primary pulmonary TB. If the child is HIV infected or in fact severely malnourished and therefore immune compromised with a high risk of going on to TB disease, strongly consider treating even if you don't have microbiological confirmation. Remember to always send away the specimens and you might get your results in a few weeks' time as well. So how do we manage a child who's got tuberculosis? We manage with medication, we manage the underlying diseases, and we protect susceptible contacts if that is indicated. Um, if this child is infectious and in the ward, we have to isolate from others so that we don't infect staff and other children. If uh, we have made the diagnosis, we refer to a local TB clinic for ongoing medication. Um, and then it is our duty to notify if the child is ill, if the child has died, we notify again. We need to consider how will we follow up the child. And if this child had previous TB and is now needs to be retreated, consider consulting an expert just so that one makes the correct decisions. So all of this must be considered when um, you think, how am I going to manage this child? It is not only TB treatment. So what does TB treatment do? It reduces at least the transmission of TB, and especially in children that have um, cavitating TB, it um, allows them to, it uh, uh, kills many organisms and makes them not infectious within a week. Of course, the aim of medication is to cure the patient from TB and eradicate bacilli as fast as possible and prevent late consequences of TB and TB death, and also to prevent relapse of TB in some months or years to come. So treating someone and inadequately treating someone and then they relapse again is certainly not desirable. And the last aim of giving the correct medication is to prevent organisms of developing mutations that will give them resistance to medication. So that is the reason that we use more than one drug in mycobacterial um, treatment, um, so that at least three drugs are used in children and four drugs are also used, and I'll explain that in later slides.
It's really important to complete the full treatment period and the DOT system is a direct observe treatment is basically a way to just encourage people and make sure that they comply with the treatment and adhere to everything. Remember that we need to practice patient-centered care. We have fixed drug combinations, which um, allows for people to not have to drink so many pills every morning, but just reduces the number of pills that need to be given. Um, remember that we have to consider drug adverse effects that occur, but fortunately these are really not common in children and not usually a problem. Make a decision. Do I want to treat this child for TB or not? And then stick to that decision. Don't stop and start TB treatment. That will only result in drug resistance developing. There is still is a problem with drug formulations, meaning that we don't have that um, child-friendly formulations. We often have tablets which need to be crushed um, for children, and we have them in sizes that don't really meet children's needs, so um, we have to adjust to that. Globally, there are several organizations working on developing child-friendly drug formulations. So remember that only since about the 1950s do we have TB medication available. This is the list of TB drugs that are called first-line TB drugs, and they are used to treat um, standard drug-sensitive tuberculosis. So in children with lymph node disease, which is not extensive disease, we use regimen 3, which is a three-drug treatment, two months of INH, RIF, and pyrazinamide, followed by four drugs, uh, four months of INH and rifampicin, meaning a total of six months treatment duration. All children with extra pulmonary disease or extensive pulmonary disease get regimen 1, which includes ethambutol as a fourth drug. Children with TB meningitis and malaria TB also get four drugs, but they get four drugs for the full six months of treatment, and ethambutol is replaced by ethionamide because ethambutol does not cross the blood-brain barrier and ethionamide does. Children who have drug-resistant TB need to be referred and the treatment plan is uh, put together according to the drug resistance profile of the child, uh, the organisms that are isolated from the child. Children that are put on TB prophylaxis, meaning the treatment of latent TB, so children that are exposed to um, people with tuberculosis but themselves don't have TB disease, are put on six months of INH. This is the list of other drugs that are available for use for patients with drug-resistant tuberculosis. Um, just a list of the effects of most of the common drugs that are used. We really have problems with um, side effects from these drugs in children. The other uh, medication that is very useful in children are steroids, and we use them in all patients with TB meningitis. We use them in large effusions and pericarditis, and sometimes in um, enlarged mediastinal nodes that compress the surrounding structures. Pyridoxine is used to obviate neuropathy associated with INH. So um, remember that when you follow up a child with TB, it's important to look at possible drug adverse effects and then to consider are there any long-term consequences that need attention. And diligent reassessment is indicated. Some children that are started on TB treatment seem to get worse after initially getting better. This is called the Immune Reconstitution Inflammatory Syndrome, or IRIS for short. Um, it is self-limiting and it passes. It is just important to actually uh, make the correct diagnosis and interpret of what is going on. So um, there are two forms of IRIS. The one is unmasking IRIS, and this often occurs in immune-compromised patients. And what happens is that as they improve um, either from 
being put onto antiretroviral treatment or their nutritional status improves, the immune um, system improves and the immune responses improve and it unmasks underlying other disease. And paradoxical iris um, occurs when you suddenly get an enlargement of lymph nodes even though the child is on TB treatment and you wonder um, why is this child seemingly getting worse but it's a inflammatory um, response of the body. So it's important to identify it and uh, in order to know what is going on. HIV and tuberculosis. So um, this is just the map showing the HIV prevalence in new TB cases overall. And you can see in South Africa, the association of HIV and TB is really um, marked. Since we are testing um, all pregnant women and all children at birth, this is not so much a problem in children. So why do I put this slide here? Is that children come from adults. And so children are in households where TB and HIV is a problem. And HIV infected adults um, have a high chance of having tuberculosis. And therefore children are at risk of TB. So the whole uh, management of HIV in this country is really important to manage TB in the long run. So any child that is HIV infected always screen for tuberculosis and all newly diagnosed HIV infected children must be put on to six months INH prophylaxis and if you are not sure of the diagnosis of TB or not in an HIV infected child have a lower threshold to start on TB treatment because of their compromised immunity. TB and HIV together may be quite difficult to make a diagnosis sometimes. So again, it's really important to send off specimens to the laboratory to try and confirm diagnosis. And in an HIV infected child with a poor immunity, TB may indeed progress quite fast and cause problems much faster than in HIV uninfected children. But finally, the diagnosis of TB is made in the same way as in HIV uninfected children. So again, consider the diagnosis with care. Send in all the specimens that you should to try and get and confirm the diagnosis. The treatment is the same as for HIV uninfected children, which is six months. Well, occasionally we do consider prolonging treatment, especially if the immune compromise is severe or if the TB disease is severe. So currently we start antiretroviral treatment within two weeks of having started TB treatment. And then consider all the other HIV complications and comorbidities. And if the patient, uh, the patient may become quite complex, consult an expert to assist you. So if a new diagnosis was made in a child uh, who is on antiretroviral treatment, they may actually get worse within the first six months, and that is iris. And um, if you make a new diagnosis in a child who's on antiretrovirals and he now develops TB, just check whether he's actually failing his antiretroviral treatment or not and um, check those um, parameters. Any child that uh, can develop a new TB infection at any time and then always think where did he possibly get it from. If the child is under three years of age, consider the household and try and initiate some reverse contact tracing. So TB treatment has to be started without delay. Antiretroviral treatment then gets started. And remember, many of these children may be sick um, and have a low weight. And once they get better, you need to adjust the dosages as they gain weight. So you now have a child on TB treatment, on cotrimoxazole, on antiretrovirals. They have a lot of medication to take. They need a lot of support. Um, and remember that if you have a family with TB, that all HIV infected children need to go on to INH prophylaxis.
And if they don't have TB for the first six months of antiretroviral treatment, you have to add um, iron H. These guidelines will be um, revisited regularly, so keep up to date. Some words on drug-resistant TB. So the definition of uh, drug-resistant TB, um, the standard definition of multi-drug resistant TB is resistance to INH and rifampicin. But um, we get different combinations. So you can have INH monoresistance, RIF monoresistance, INH and RIF together, which is the most common. And then you can have INH and RIF resistance and then resistance to other organisms as well, uh, other drugs as well. And then you have um, more extensive drug resistant TB. The cause of drug resistant TB is that uh, you get poor concentration of drugs. Patients don't take their drugs regularly, you get low concentrations, and the organisms can start developing um, resistance to these medications. So when do we suspect it is if the patient doesn't improve or if there is a known drug resistant TB person who is a possible source case to the children. And this is most commonly the reason in children. It's important to get a culture to confirm the diagnosis if possible. And remember again, it's by gene expert PCR and culture of the specimen. Drug resistant TB is treated with at least four drugs to which the organism is sensitive. It's very expensive to treat these patients as they need to be treated for nine to 18 months. Um, Fortunately, now we are no longer using intravenous treatment, um, but all of these children need to be referred to a center that treats children with drug-resistant TB, um, as this is a little bit um, more complex and continuity of care is really important. If you think you have a patient with drug-resistant TB, never just add another drug, refer the patient. Here's a map showing you um, the TB cases, the new TB cases that have drug-resistant TB, and you can see where the hotspots are. So Sub-Saharan Africa certainly has um, drug-resistant TB and is a problem, but not so much a problem as Eastern Europe and the Russian Federation states. Um, you can see large parts of Africa don't really have data yet, so we don't know. How do we prevent TB? We improve the general health of the population, a very functioning healthcare system of which you and me are part. We need to find cases, diagnose them early and treat them appropriately. How do we prevent TB in the population at large? We address problems of poverty and inequality. We try and reduce cigarette smoking reduce alcohol abuse, improve nutrition, in, and pay attention to indoor and outdoor pollution. In the healthcare environment, how do we prevent TB? Uh, emphasize cough etiquette. Uh, check how your patient flow is in the institution. So keep adults and children separate, especially in the um, clinic setting or in the casualty setting and identify people that have TB symptoms. So identify coffers, evaluate them soon, uh, give them a mask and um, separate them and evaluate them soon and decide where they should go. Make sure that you have good ventilation of your facility. In hospital, identify the infectious children. So this would be children that have cavitations. Identify infectious parents or caregivers in the ward. Um, we have identified quite a few mothers in the ward that are there with their children um, and we diagnosed the children with TB and we sent the caregiver or parent for an x-ray and lo and behold they had obvious TB actually potentially infecting the other children and the healthcare workers and the other parents. Have isolation facilities available and remember that masks are important for healthcare workers, especially those that collect sputum and they need to wear N95 masks. All healthcare workers should be aware of their HIV status 
and should be tested for tuberculosis should they have symptoms. BCG vaccination can also prevent tuberculosis. So there are many countries that still give BCG vaccine. It's a vaccine that's about 100 years old. Um, it doesn't really impact the epidemic itself and it doesn't impact adult disease. However, it protects young children from getting extensive severe disease that can result in lifelong disability. So BCG vaccine is given to all children up to one year of age. Um, and just be aware that um, BCG disease can occur in children who are, have some immune deficiency and one needs to identify these. BCG is an alive attenuated vaccine and it uses Embovis. And in immune uh, deficient children, it may cause disease. And if you pick any of these up, they need to be referred. If there's a source case in a household with tuberculosis, it's important to try and identify uh, whether the children are diseased or whether they are infected. And all under five year old children, if they are infected, have a high risk of developing TB, TB disease. So we need to figure out, are they infected or are they diseased? And so we use a symptom screen, weigh them, a chest x-ray, and a skin test may or may not be useful. And we need to look at the risk factors. What are the risks or that they may have been infected? We need to test for HIV. And if we do not detect disease, they get six months of Iron Age prophylaxis to kill the few organisms that are there. So um, just to show you how we do that, so um, we may have one child who's asymptomatic, has no abnormal signs, he has a significant man reaction, his chest x-ray is normal, so he has no disease, but he is infected. So he needs to be treated with six months of INH to eradicate the infection. We have another child who actually has TB disease. He looks exactly the same. He's asymptomatic, he's not ill, he has no abnormal clinical signs, he also has a reactive uh, TB skin test. However, we were diligent, we did a chest x-ray and it is abnormal, so he no longer has latent TB, but he has TB disease and so he needs to have six months of standard TB treatment. Um, this is a map just to show you which countries um, give fairly adequate um, TB preventive treatment, which means INH, um, six months of INH to children under one year of age. And you can see we are not doing optimally at this stage. So in summary, what are the important points? So TB in children needs to be prevented and it's important to treat latent TB infection, which would be the six months of iron age in children under five who are exposed to somebody with TB. TB in children presents differently to adults. Adenitis is common, both mediastinal and neck adenitis, and for that we only need three drugs. All other forms of TB in children are also treated with four drugs. There's a high risk of disease progression and of severe disease and of extra pulmonary disease compared to adults. The diagnosis may be missed and is not, may not be easy to make. And importantly, send off appropriate, adequate specimens to the laboratory. So what's new? Diagnosis, rapid molecular testing and genome sequencing is becoming much more important. The treatment of latent TB or the prophylaxis of TB, um, those are sort of similar, uh, the same terms, uh, different terms used for the same concept. So we use six months of INH. Some countries use three months of INH and rifampicin. And there are studies using weekly rifapentin. It's not yet done in South Africa. What's new? There are new drugs regarding uh, drug-resistant TB, and we no longer have to use IV TB treatment. What's new regarding prevention? There is a promising vaccine candidate, 
you might hear of it in a few years' time. What's important? Making a good diagnosis, adequate treatment, and prevention on all sides. High quality care, people centered care, we need a lot of political will to institute all of these measurements and we need good access to care of our patients. So hopefully by 2030 um, we can then achieve goals and hopefully by 2035 we can nearly eradicate tuberculosis in the world. Please stay up to date. Where can you find information? So the WHO provides a lot of information. There's a journal against TB and lung disease. And um, I would greatly encourage you to download the Diagnostic Atlas of Intrathoracic Tuberculosis in Children. Type this into Google. You can download the PDF. It is a very good uh, document to teach you how to look at chest X-rays of children with tuberculosis. Thank you very much.